This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. For me personally, it was definitely the hatred of losing. I was not a guy that was about pageantry. I was not a guy that was about the parade. Um, when I wrestled in Atlanta, um, I rented a three-cylinder Geo with my wife, drove home and mowed the lawn because it hadn't been mowed for a month. And I remember one of our neighbors driving by and they were like, they did a double take. Like, well, that's the, I thought he was in Atlanta. Well, I was in Atlanta yesterday and just sat on the stand and got a gold medal put around my neck. Um, that's how I was. Um, that doesn't mean that it was the right approach or the wrong approach. It's just what worked for me. But when you were a kid, you and Terry, you dreamed about winning that Olympic gold. Yeah, That's so about winning then there is the 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 lure of winning, but what drives you is that um, you know as you move forward, there's just no reason that you have to settle for anything but being the best. Mm -hmm. And if if it just it would get to you to the point where that's not going to happen to me again. That's the thought that drives you in your training. That's why you do, you know, nine ropes when Gable says do three ropes and buddy push-ups and you're out of here. And you do nine or you do them until you can't do any more. And it's a very rare ingredient. The older I get, the more rare I find it is. The ingredient of loss feeding, feeding that the drive of hard training. Maybe that because everybody's so worried about the negative whatever and you're putting too much pressure on yourself. So maybe that. But what I meant was is when a coach says, okay, finish with four ropes and, you know, buddy push-ups and four-way neck, you know, I would do 12 or 10. That's rare. I'm I'm guy that remembers um, my career that well. Um, I know that I am judged on a very small portion of my life and it's minutes of wrestling matches you know a lot of a lot of winning but there's some losing in there too and you know people think they know you because of that and they think they know you because they see you in a press conference but um you know to go back to the original question you know i don't know how to answer that so there's no losses that just that eat at you still. There's opponents that I have learned a great deal from. I mean, my loss to John Smith uh, in 1991 um, U.S. Open was something that I learned a lot about. Um, I learned a lot about positioning. I learned a lot about the importance of parterre. Um, you know, in a certain kind of crazy way, I learned that I could go with the best guy in the world, even though it was 14 to four. Mm -hmm. And this is when tech falls were 15 or 12 points. So I didn't get tech fall. And I wasn't, that wasn't a badge of honor for me, but I knew I could go with him because it was one point takedowns. I scored four takedowns on him. And I learned that I had to move my feet. Um, and I learned what it meant to move your feet constantly. And, and there's no break. John Smith is a very, very intense competitor that people know that now, six time world Olympic champion. And I felt that firsthand. But I did not go in there um, taking a back seat, even though the score um, was very lopsided. But you knew you could stand with the best of the world. I knew that I, this is what this is about. And you know what? You move your feet and you don't give up a lace that's so damn tight that it, you're, you can't you know, feel your calf muscle. You know, and I had to get ready for the consolation side of the bracket because I believe that was in the semis. You know, you know, you just learn from that. And it was, it was better than learning from, you know, a win over a second ranked senior level guy when you're a junior in college. Right. You know, you're wrestling the best on a stage. I would be more probably in my older age, I probably would have been more relaxed in my training and probably would have went another cycle if I could do it over again. Um, in 96, I really thought that if, when Gable retired that I would be the next guy in line, and I was wrong, and that was immature of me. In, in terms of the coach. In coach. terms of the coach, yes. 
And I knew that Gable was close. I mean, I, I didn't know when, but it just so happens, you know, 97 was his record breaking year and then he retired. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know how close he was, but I knew that he had, you know, he went down with a bad hip injury. And, and so, you know, you're just, you're, you're not gonna. So what is, know, what, what is a relaxed Tom Brands look like? You're saying you would, you would have been a little more uh, relaxed. More like where, you know what? I was pretty dang good and I was getting better every day but maybe do it a little bit different, a little bit smarter. And Terry actually did that going through 2000. Uh, he had to do it. And he would have been in, in the, you know, the funny farm, let alone the, you know, the, the physical farm, whatever you want to say, he'd been mentally and physically beat up, but um, he had to learn to less is more type approach. Right. And, how it came around was, is, you know, you work hard at feeling good. You work hard in your recovery. So even when you're not wrestling hard in that wrestling room and looking for the toughest partner mm -hmm. to go, you're still working hard in your recovery. In recovery. And massage could be that. Stretching could be that. Um, thing, things like that that are more fluffy. In, in and that's body. something you weren't as good at the recovery. Uh, never, never. Um, there, there's not a place for it with young people, because in, in my opinion, you, you, there's so much development to have happen. Hmm. I mean, when when you need to learn wrestling, you need to be wrestling. And as you get older, um, you, you, your body won't do it anymore. And so, to learn wrestling, it's more of a probably a relaxed approach. both um it's the same and i like to live wrestling i was always wanting to live wrestle bring the warm-up into the live wrestle let's go um but where i got really really good was a repetition and i was disciplined enough to know that the things that you hate to do in this sport are the things that make you the very best and that is a rare ingredient as i've gotten older and you spend a lot of time communicating that to younger athletes so the thing if you feel yourself hating something, that's probably a thing you should be doing. Yes. As a matter of fact, I had a strength coach when I was really young. He was just a freaking guy that would, he wore white, like he was almost like a nurse, nurse's clothes. He wore all white from head to toe and he was in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And his first name was Walt. And he taught Terry and I to hate the bar away from you on that last rep when you're dead. And whether it's a curl, you hated up. And then you do the negative and you hate it down and you hate that bench up and you hate it. You look at the bar and you hate it away from you. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, you know, I learned and that I was young. I was young. And um, I remember being bored. My mom's sister lived out there and we were dropped off to stay out there with our cousins and I was bored a little bit. And they always treated us really good. But this was like the the single most um, bright spot in a, in a weightlifting, like enlightenment, mm -hmm. even though I lifted weights. But I never knew the psychology behind lifted weights. It's just to look good and, and so you can flex and look in the mirror or is it for performance? And this guy was about performance. And you said repetition. Do you mean technique? I'm talking repetition, technique, 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 drill, 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 hit, 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 drive, finish, hit, 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 drive, finish. So you believe in that? You believe I in believe that in that guys? wholeheartedly. So, I mean... Uh... And I believe that you have to do it on your own. I don't believe in the coach taking you to the promised land. I think it's rare. I think it's very rare. And I think it's especially rare. I mean, you can talk about that as a coach, but it's especially rare to uh, bring a guy to that understanding, but you never stop trying. You're always trying to reach him. I mean, we didn't have a good performance out there tonight, but you know what? You don't stop communicating. And there's a lot of programs out there that put their head down when things aren't going their way. And then as things start going their way, then they rise with the tide. There was no difference in the demeanor of, that, that of our corner. And we talk about that. that's a philosophy. And so you're reaching your guys that way. Um, so go back to your point or your question. You know, do you believe in the, in the 10,000 reps? And yes, I do. And... <laughs> and it's very rare to have somebody that goes in there and 
will do it on their own. Do you, do you have young guys that step up and do that? We do, and it's rare. And the guys that do it on their own and have done it on their own are the guys that are in that lineup and, and doing well. Right. Um, the other thing is, is that when you talk about uh, getting to that next level, um, a lot of times it's, you know, what held you back was I did everything the coach asked of me and nothing more. Right. I mean, you can be a great guy for a, for an a, for a coach as an athlete and you did everything that coach asked, but you did nothing more. So you're really looking for the guys that go way beyond what the coach we says. don't want guys that are looking at their watch running out of the room when practice is over we and, want guys that know what they have to get done and they might leave early but they're not looking at their watch right. they might be done early they might be we might be on a whole different path and this guy just excuses himself i'm all about that we are a, not we are not autocrats there's an internal engine in there is that something you're born with or is that something you can develop? I think you are born with it. You develop it also. And I think that there has to be comfort. And I go back to the communication mm -hmm. that young people are comfortable enough to communicate that I need to take the day off. Right. Communication to me is, is, is letting them know what they're what they need to do to get themselves in contention to be the starting quarterback mm -hmm. um and then to give them boosts and compliments when they mm -hmm. earn them um and i don't have time to waste with um with lies and cheating and when I say cheating, I'm talking about when they cheat themselves. And so right. those become very direct conversations. And the conversation starts like this. I don't have time to waste and neither do you. And so why are we wasting our time? And here's what I mean by that. We're having a conversation about you know, your accountability. If you look in the mirror and you're accountable, then we aren't, we aren't taking the time to go through this. We're already on our way to solving the problem. Problem can't be solved without that understanding. And that has to do with symptoms that you see in the wrestling room. There's something where the that fire's not quite there. That has to do with mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. Got it. Everything. Everything that you know about. You know, I had a boss, and our athletic director is a great athletic director, and he gives us everything we need to be successful. Mm -hmm. But I had a boss, his name was Fred Mims, and I didn't think anybody could be better than him. And then all of a sudden, this Gene Taylor guy came in. And, I didn't, and then he was pretty doggone good, too. And he actually you know, was just like Fred and maybe even a little bit more current. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up taking a job at Kansas State where he's the athletic director now. And uh, and then this this lady, Barbara Burke, comes in. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think anybody could be better than Gene Taylor or Fred Mims. And this Barbara Burke, she's better than both of them. And the reason why is because she's a problem solver. She doesn't waste time. She's direct and she's a problem solver. And that's what we need. You need problem solvers. train mental toughness by putting them in situations that uh, they're willing to go through but don't think they can make it and then they go through it and then all of a sudden those barriers are down does that have to do uh with physical usually exhaustion with the it four reps to, on the ropes you... it has to do with that and it has to do with uh understanding why we're doing it and sometimes understanding why we're doing it might not come for months mm -hmm. but there's blind faith and we have a heavyweight in the room right now this this young guy that um he's like that he doesn't necessarily understand it he asks a lot of questions but he does it and he's been here four months now four and a half months now and he's getting better every day so mental toughness too is a matter of repetition so you, that's mental developed. toughness is a matter of repetition and having an open mind and being extremely accountable and and not only accountable that when you maybe um when something doesn't go your way that you look in the mirror and own it but accountable to the point of view that you know what i got to get tough in this situation right here right now and this is what's going to make or break me and i talked about my own career being defined by you know a couple of minutes on the mat but that's when you're going to be defined. That's how you're going to be defined. That's okay. So people are going to talk about you. So you might as well have them talking about how doggone tough you are. <laughs> mm -hmm.
peaking and burnout are frames of mind or burnout is a is a like you let things probably get to the point where you could have arrested them with a good frame of mind uh, but peaking is a frame of mind and you know you have to know be able to read and that's a lot of it and the individual athlete also has to know that it's a frame of mind and so when you have a coach that's reading that the right way and you have an athlete that is knowing that it, when zero hour comes, that you're going to be ready to go. Um, and knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel, if you feel like you're burning that candle at both ends, light's coming at the, at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you're good to go. I do think it's possible to overtrain if you have a lot of distractions. So, and if yeah. you're looking at your watch running out of the room... Right then yeah, you're going to, in that frame of mind, isn't right. going to lend itself to excellency. And the thing is, is we, we have to accomplish what we need to get accomplished to get better every day. You can't kind of accomplish what you need to accomplish. You have to accomplish it. And when, when you're in that mindset, then the clock is irrelevant. Right. There's no place for a clock in the wrestling room right. and maybe a clock that times a match, but it may be a clock if, you know, we're, we're at student athletes here. But that's why we encourage our, you know, when, when you schedule your classes that you don't have a class that comes right up to, you know, practice time or starts as a night class and it starts at 530. Right. You know, go to get the 630 class or the seven o'clock. So you leave it all behind your heart, your passion is completely in it. There's no, and when you walk in that wrestling room, there's no distractions and it's never eternal. The only thing that's eternal is death. You know, there's nothing. Sometimes guys come in there and they wig out. Oh, it's an hour and 25 minutes of, oh, or an hour and 45 minutes of, oh. Yeah. A lot of discipline, and it's a lot of discipline during a very uncomfortable time period that really doesn't last that long, but it feels like it lasts long and it's painful. And But once you shrink your body down, and if you're hydrated, you'll get through it. If you're a little hungry, but you're eating, but you're hydrated, once you break that sweat, your energy depletion goes away. That's a fact. I've practiced that. You come in and you're yawning and you're, you know, you're starting to shrink your body down. And it's that time of year where, hey, I got to get my body shrunk down and you're dehydrated. You are dead in the water. Mm -hmm. But if you're hungry and hydrated, when you break that sweat, have people gotten better with that over the years, over the past few decades? I think that coaches, science is better. I think that coaches communicate it. I think they always have. I think the bottom line is, is having the energy to implement that and taking a guy by the hand when he doesn't understand and he's new in your program and he's essential and or he's unwilling to and not disciplined enough because when you take them by the hand enough, they will learn that discipline. This is an important aspect of wrestling, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not just go and show up for the match. I mean, it's not about just making weight either. You got to be able to make weight. That's part of the warm up. That's part of the process, getting ready to wrestle. I don't know. I mean, I found out I, I got I really addicted to wrestling really, really fast. Started late, but looking back at my life, um, wrestled my whole life with my twin brother. Mm -hmm. And when Terry and I would fight, it was wrestling and it was to maim. And so if, if you were, if you're, if so, if you're trying to maim me, I better be tough. Cause if I roll over and expect you to scratch my belly, when you're trying to maim me, I will lose my head. And Tom and Terry brands, there was no alpha male. And when it was on, it was on for real. What do you mean there's no alpha male? There's bo there was, both. There, a lot of twins, there's a dominant twin. Oh, a lot of them. Ah. Very few times is there a situation where you're going to, I'm going to win every time in everything. And then he's thinking the same exact way. Mm -hmm. And Terry used to describe it like in, when we used to get interviewed a lot about our careers. Um, like it'd be like you grabbing a steering wheel and me grabbing a steering wheel and fighting. And that's what it was like when you would wrestle him or fight him. And so I had that benefit. So when did I know? Well, I got addicted to wrestling really, really fast in fifth grade and started to research it. And I don't know why. And talked about the Olympics and 
um, put it in my head and uh, remember said something about being an Olympic champion in fifth grade and somebody made fun of me and I got in a fight in the playground. And uh, I remember um, getting pulled in, getting in trouble for that. And <laughs> the people that got me in trouble for that were smart enough to not rake me over the coals, but they researched or they actually found out what the fight was about. Mm -hmm. And I was distraught. I was, I was really emotional, like crying or whatever you want to say. You don't want to admit that too many times, but, um, but it wasn't because I got beat up or got my nose bloody or got yeah. punched in the face or broke my arm it, or there was any pain. It was because they stomped on my dream and they doubted me. And so I fought for that. And, you know, that was a lesson. There's going to be a lot of doubters. And what, one thing we talk about as a staff is our staff has to be lockstep in that hallway, in our offices. And when you deviate outside of that, that is heresy. So everybody has to be on board, confident that you're going to be number one. When in the we country, go forward and we go put our public foot forward, there is a decision. We are unified and there is no backbiting. Mm -hmm. And we have great people right now. And we hadn't had that before. We've had det detractors in our Hawkeye Wrestling Club. We've had guys that would go out and get rolled up in ankle laces and not care in our club. And we got Brandon Sorensen who got rolled up by James Green last night. But I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. You know why? Because I know it means a lot to him. He didn't roll over. He didn't quit because he was on the consolation side of a bracket. And so when you have that and then you have, you know, if there's a disagreement, it's behind closed doors and then you're moving forward. And when you have people that when they're meeting your fans and your supporters, you know, they're talking the right way with the right message. And anything that's catty wonkus to that, you, you got to be careful there. You got to be careful there. And that's probably where my hatred of losing trumps my love for winning. Because I wanted to shove it up their rear end bad. Yeah. And the thing is, is we maintain a high level and there's very few programs. Oh, Oklahoma State, Ohio State now, Penn State. I mean, there's four programs that try to win a national title every year. And that's it. And these 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 other teams, they get up and they, they got a good team and they get up and they get going. And then when when things don't go well, okay, we're gonna do it next year. Or this is a down year. We're gonna we're gonna get ready. We're three years out. So no matter what you're fighting for first. We, we, we do, and we haven't won. And you say, Well, we haven't won in eight years. Well, you're right, we haven't. But look at our results are better better than anybody out there and it's because and besides penn state and it's because of our mentality and because we have great people ryan morningstar bobby telford terry brands our medical team even our strength coach quinn holland we're all on the same page and when i sense something i hit it immediately i don't have time to waste there will not be dissension in that hallway <laughs> It really mind. doesn't matter. Um, I have a routine that, you know, I had a routine as a competitor that I could run through right now. Um, it was a lot of self-talk, very, very positive self-talk. Visualization? Yes, just... visualization, um, self-talk. Um, and, and that's how I, I was able to relax in getting ready for matches my whole life. Learned that very early age at a camp, at a developmental camp, at a young age, Terry and I did. And... Um, I can tell you what I ate and I can tell you what I did to relax and it doesn't matter. Um, what you have to do is you have to find that peace. And I just know that when I was getting ready for the finals match, I had gone back to my room. I had my relaxed material, you know, and I was able to relax because I prepared for it. <laughs> And you know what? I don't talk about that and nobody else does either, but everybody talks about it in their own career. So now you're making my head big. But yeah, <laughs> I had a road. I had a road. You're right. You see the draw and it's a two-day tournament. So psychology comes into it as much as physical shape, um, you know, because there's those you got to sleep you know, the night before after the weigh-in, then you got to sleep again that next night after your semifinal match is going to be in the morning. 
you know, and then you have to go back and rest because your final match isn't until whatever time it was. Mm -hmm. And so all this relaxation and all that stuff that you just talked about, that visualization and self-talk, that's what helps you. It's your routine. And you was there any doubt, any fear, any anything there? The fear is the type of fear, and I just talked about this to one of my athletes today. Um, Jack Dempsey talked about fear, and the fear of losing is what motivated him to try to take his opponent's head off. He was a boxer, and um, that's okay. So fear of competition, fear of screwing up, fear of, oh, I don't feel good, no. No, but that little fear that, you know what, there's somebody out there that thinks that, you know what, they, they're going to, they're going to revel in my, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to eat it up in my misery. They're going to love, they're going to be thriving because I fail and, and I'm not going to let that happen. I think you come to peace that in the end, when it's over, that you did the best you could. And that's certainly the case with Terry. Um, he has a career credentials are better than mine internationally. You know, he won two world championships. I won one and he won Olympic bronze medal. And, um, you know, I won an Olympic gold medal, but I only won one. And, and the thing is, is that's not what's important anyway. What's important is, is that when it's all over, you know, how do you look back on it? And you're kind of like, well, you just said that you made sure that you weren't going to leave anything undone. But you know what? There were tournaments where I did leave things undone. And so how do you come back from that? Well, Terry never came back from 2000 because he retired. Mm. Well, you know what? You duplicate and exceed when you're communicating to these young athletes. And because of that experience, that makes Terry a better coach. Because of, you know, 1995, that makes me a better coach you know, realizing that there are certain things that unraveled in that year that I could have controlled looking back on it. And when you have that perspective, you can communicate. So what control is there? Can you control everything? How, how, how big of a role is luck? Control in this whole thing? how you react to an injury, control that. So you can't, you don't have any control over it. It's over, you know, you have whatever. And, whatever happened, but relax. And, and you learn to deal with injuries better because of that. You have that experience that you let this thing maybe get the best of you. And that's just an example. And, you know, Terry put a lot of demons to rest with that bronze medal. So becoming an Olympic medalist, a I few mean, demons got, could relax. Well, a little, he'll never admit that. And he probably is truthful. And I should, I'm speaking for him, but he is truthful when he says that. But if, if I look at it and bronze sucks, um, but if I look at it, he did put some demons to rest and I'm proud of him for it. Um, there's something there that is a consolation in the fact that he won the consolation medal. The consolation medal sucks but there is a consolation that he won the consolation. You, that's where your psychology comes in and that's where the repetition and all of self-talk and visualization and the physical shape and everything comes together. And so that doesn't happen. And tonight, you, we got beat twice, actually three times, and we out-wrestled those. We, we lost three matches and we out-wrestled the guy for six minutes and... Mm -hmm. 30 seconds or one, one match went to overtime. And if our guys can move forward with the right perspective, I'm confident that they'll be better. Um, I'll tell you what, I'd take our guy over their guy any day, any day. Cause our guys get up for every match and now we got a lot to work on. Right. We got a lot to work on, but you know what? I can say all that and I'll take our guy and blah, blah, blah. But what are they going to do tonight in their meal? How are they going to What grow? are they going to do tonight in their rest? What are they going to do tomorrow in their recovery on their own necessarily? What are they going to do Monday? Great wrestlers can use their imagination with a win that they're not satisfied with and go forward as if it was a loss. But it's still easier to go forward with that win. But they can, they don't just, 
oh, I won, I'm fine, it goes on. But then when they lose the exact same way that they could have lost before, then they go off the deep end. And then that's when they're going to make the change in their life. And we talked, to, we talked about that to our team tonight. And the, the mature, rare ingredient is, is guys that can get better even with success like it was a loss without beating themselves up. That's complicated. I think that we need to put them both together and the individual impacts the team. And, um, you know, we haven't done that since 2010 and we need to do a better job of putting 10 weight classes out there that contribute to the team. And if it's not 10, then it's nine. And if it's not nine, it can't be four, you know, and that takes a lot of pride and it takes a lot of, um, you know, where the coach is on top of it. And, you know, you're not just working on the easy things, the glaring things, you're working on everything. What do you mean by everything? So the... Well, like there's just some, you know, there's ideas that, um, when you're a coach, uh, that aren't, they're beneath the surface and you got to find them. Hmm. And, and so that's where communication comes in. Yeah. But you're talking about, yeah, we got to move forward. Well, what does that mean? Well, I know what that means, but how many, how many guys really know what that means in their program? You know, there's so many levels of that. <laughs> I don't think that that's a bad thing to have that mentality. I mean, I think of Kudakov. Um, I remember a story I read about him. He comes to mind. Um, you know, um, Sargush. I remember when he lost in London. And I remember the look uh, on his face. And those are some of the greatest wrestlers in the history of the sport, freestyle wrestling. And um, you know what? It's what works for you. And you, you can talk about being at peace with your results and, and that the approach is and the journey is what it's about. But, um, and that's great. Mm -hmm. And that relaxes some champions and that makes some champions really, really tick. Um, but not everybody. So it's okay. It's okay. And if that wigs you out and that, that really makes you uptight, then, then, then go the other route. You have to find what works for you. And that takes a lot of work. If you're lazy, forget it. Forget it. I think there's a balance, and, and, or not even a balance, there's a line that you go up to and you, you can't cross it. Sportsmanship is everything. You can get dinged for points. You can get thrown out of tournaments. There's rules with um, flagrant misconduct where you're kicked out of the match. Other team gets the points, and then you have to sit the next meet. Uh, so it's very serious. The NCAA uh, sends a message, a uh, very serious message about sportsmanship. Yeah. And so we talk about that. And the other thing with wrestling is there's rules in wrestling. Mm -hmm. These guys that are tough guys uh, outside of the rules, that's, that's what you want in your opponent. That means they're frustrated. You gotta, exactly. be a, you gotta be a tough guy inside the rules of the sport. That, that's more honorable then cold cocking somebody and knocking them out. Come and do what you're doing tonight. I mean, break bread with me in my kitchen and see how big of a jackass I am. Now you're a pretty nice guy. Well, I'm not asking for that necessarily, but thanks. I'm saying, <laughs> you know what? You, 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 as a coach, I mean, come, okay, come spend a month in our program and you'll see really what kind of, what kind of people we are. And there's a stigma out there because they are very threatened by our program. There's nobody else that threatens the sport of wrestling like we do. And that's the truth. There's a legend to Iowa wrestling. There's a, it's one of the most intimidating. Sort there's of a legend to John Smith. It's the same thing. But it they get up for John Smith. They get up for Oklahoma State. They get up for Penn State. My question is, okay, I'll answer it this way. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example in my coaching career. I coached at Virginia Tech for 22 months. Mm -hmm. We recruited the number one recruiting class. We got the administration to change 
hundred percent 180 how they looked at wrestling. Here's the thing, and because of how serious we were, and because we weren't idiots, we were able to do that with our administration. But my point is this: we tried to win. We tried to win, even at Virginia Tech. It wasn't a stepping stone for me. It ended up being one quickly. And, and looking back on it, I was a fool to think that I'd be there for 20 years. But That's you I said something about that too in a book, and I think I was misquoted one time. Um, <laughs> and actually, it was Gable's quote. And I was trying to make the point that Gable's quote was like this. And, you know, they were making it like it was my own words. I think it was a first wrestling tough book, but it's a good um, book. It's a good book. Um, but the story's Gable's. And I don't know if there's anybody that has done that besides him. And I think that's a very rare quality. Um, but I've definitely been in that nirvana level <laughs> of, you know, either you, you, you could go all day long and it doesn't, you have to, you have to shoot me to stop me. Yeah. But there's a balance because you're not going hard with uh, and holding your breath. It's not a, uh, it's a relaxed and like you got a guy cornered and who's most dangerous. Well, the guy that's cornered. And so that's where you relax. I'm not bum rushing him. I'm relaxed. I'm, I'm still moving, fake and very fluid. The guy falls down in space. I run around behind him. That's offense. You don't have to just grunt to the leg and call that offense. Offense is a in and out, smooth. Do, and we're raising $20 million for a facility to make it the best facility on the planet. We have a vision to build the best facility on planet Earth and put the best wrestlers in it. And that is bigger than wrestling. Hmm. Um, it's for the University of Iowa. And our donors are doing it for the University of Iowa. But it is about the value of wrestling to me also. There is so much value to wrestling. Blind Blind people don't play football, they wrestle. Blind people don't play basketball. I mean, maybe they do, but it'd be very difficult. They can wrestle. Wrestling is a feel sport. Yeah, there's and, no ball, there's nothing. It's just two guys or two girls and that's it. That's right. And and you, 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 I mean, I'm not gonna say you can't because somebody will get a hold of this and <laughs> I'll get an email or a letter that says, you said blind people can't play baseball and blah, blah. I'm, I'm just saying that blind people can wrestle very effectively. Yes. I've wrestled with, with my eyes shut. I mean, was honest about it too. And it was, I was effective. So why, why was I able to be effective? Because it's wrestling is a, is, a, is a sport that you, you can overcome a lot. Your demons that you're overcoming, they're not limited with whether I'm blind or not, the demons that are overcoming are so, inside you. You have to overcome those demons from within. We have a good young group of guys and, um, you know, there is a lot of buzz in the program and probably hasn't been this much buzz for quite some time. And our job is to, you know, be relaxed and be focused and not get caught up in the buzz. Uh, but we have to put it together and we have a catalyst, Spencer Lee, but he's going to have to, he's going to have to get better. And we have some other catalysts as well that are, um, you know, going to help us in the future. Um, but they got to get better. And so all this stuff about independence and accountability and, you know, being able to get better every day under duress, and not knowing that you're getting better, but you are, you know, you know what that, you know what I mean by that? Like the great thing about Gable was wrestling for him was, is you were getting better and you didn't know you were getting better. All of a sudden you do something in the practice room that you've been working on and all of a sudden you hit it and it's like, it was automatic. Yeah. And then that, you know, Built. Com yeah, that multiplies success and... Things I talked about, things that you can't control, you turn them over. So the biggest thing for me is I got to turn over the things that I can't control, turn them over to that power. 
and I'm going to be a lot better off. And that's the reason why I'm not in the funny farm. Because <laughs> it's very competitive to me. Yeah. It's very serious that we we know that these young wrestlers come to school here to be the best that they can be and to accomplish goals that, like me, when I was young, they've set out to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And they chose Iowa to do that. So we have to deliver. And because of that um, peace with God, you know, it's pure. It's a pure motivation. It's a pure um, platform. It's not, it's not doing this for my ego. We're not corrupt people. We're not liars and cheaters. And so often uh, that gets in the way of a decent person. Her story of that is that she didn't want me to have to remember the number. Oh, and I say nice at, this at this point, and I say, there's no way. And I remember it very clearly. Like, hey, it's in the phone book. And I was like, okay, she's blowing me off. That's okay. <laughs> but luckily, anyway, here's the thing with family. I mean, we, we have great people in our program. We have great parents. We have a culture of parents that that's part of the buzz. Mm -hmm. And this class that you see wrestling right now, that's been here a year now, um, Lee, Mirren, Costello, Warner, and then Lugo was a transfer. And I'm forgetting somebody. And I don't want to forget anybody, but um, these parents are phenomenal. And that's a different parental culture. Um, so the Kemmer's dad is the same. And, and um, so there's a lot of good there. And that, that's a big, that's a big, a big boom because how we talk to parents, we don't talk to parents to get along with them. We talk to parents to help them understand you know, where we're at with their sons. Mm -hmm. And when you can have a direct conversation with a parent who helping his son or her son, the mom, helping her son to be accountable and to own it, then you can get a lot accomplished. And that's what we've been able to do. And so you're solving problems, like I talked about earlier. Um, that's part of the family. The other part of the family is the coaches um, are like family. The other part of the family is the coaches of significant others and wives are part of the family. And we fed, you know, we fed 40 guys and an entire coaching staff and wives and their children here at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and that equals 70 people. Yeah. And it's it's fun. It's fun. So family means administration. Gary Barda, my my athletic director, gives us everything that we need to be successful. And he has an open mind for, for the sport of wrestling. Mm -hmm. And wrestling's important in Iowa, so that's a no-brainer, but not if you're not a wrestling guy, but he sees we do it the right way. And so the commitment is there from him. If we were doofuses, you know, he the commitment wouldn't be there. So family is, everybody's all in. I mean, it's from the wrestlers to the family. It goes to back to what I said earlier about our people. Our people are great. Ryan Morningstar is great. Bobby Telford is great. Um, Bobby Telford took over for a guy named Ben Burhau, who is great. Um, our medical team is great. Dr. Westerman, Dr. Wolf, uh, Jesse Donaworth, our athletic trainer, is great. Um, uh, Terry Brands is great. Mariah Stickley and, and Elise Owens, our managers, are great. My daughter's a manager as well. It's great. Um, they're they're hardworking young women. Our, rest, our Hawkeye Wrestling Club is is where it needs to be in terms of how they help in their role. And now we have four women in there and, and that's great. And, you know, at least one of their dads is super involved with us. But, um, and so it's w one thing that I've learned is that you have to have that. And if you don't have that, then you have to address it quickly. And those outliers, you know, let's solve that problem. Let's get it out in the open here. Right. And if they're, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's not going to work out. That's a heck of a Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, next year. Well, I don't know if it'd be legal, but <laughs> I'd have to check with our compliance and, you know, they'd have to vet you. You could come. You can come and see what it's all about. This room is full. <laughs> Okay, so what's... I won the race. Did rate, you cheat? Here's what happened. 
I had researched this thing because I'm that's how I am. You practiced. No, I didn't, but I researched it. In swimming, if you flinch on that starter block, mm -hmm. it's a false start. You can't twitch a finger. And because they would be doing that to get their buddy to move or the guy next to him, you know? So you have to be rock solid. Yeah. Well, when we went, Terry was leaning forward as the gun was going off. So he's moving. And so I was like, no, 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 false start. No, 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 no. And he couldn't hear me. He was already in the water. And so he took off like a bat out of you know where <laughs> for the end of the pool and couldn't hear me and got to the end of the pool and it was a down and back. Well, that's a hard thing to do with a guy with no body fat. Yeah. And so he burned a lot of energy ah. and he come up on that end of the pool and he was like, where's, where's he at? Cause he didn't see me. Huh. And so we stopped him and then he came back and then we went another one and I beat him. Uh, but it's the only time that, you know, I would say that he was tuckered out and that's the reason why. And um, I'll also say this, we did a time where we timed my race, the one I won and then we timed his first down to the wall. And then we timed his, the actual race where once he hit the wall, we timed him on the way back and he'd beat me. Now, how's that for being a... I mean, that's past. I mean, we he's got an UNO title. We have UNO world mm -hmm. championships. He's got an oh. UNO title. I have, I have yet to have one. Morningstar has two titles. That's unprecedented. <laughs> So there's only four trophies out there, and Terry's got one of those, and I don't have one yet. This is the Lex Free Podcast.